is involved in the uh, basically the, in, was working with the Unilever R&D and then in the fragrance industry, especially in applying GC, 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 TOF, MS and HR, HR, TOF, MS to solve range of analysis ch challenges. Yeah, so let's welcome uh, Dr. Nick to make a presentation. And the stage is yours. Nick, go ahead. Hello, uh, so good morning, um, good afternoon, uh, depending where you are. Um, Hopefully you can see the, the presentation um, and it will flow from screen to screen okay after the testing we did earlier. So um, as uh, you briefly heard, um, I work for Lico Corporation um, and our uh, main interests are providing technology solutions um, in the field of time of flight mass spectrometry, in particular with comprehensive two-dimensional GC times GC separations. And in the area of microplastics, we're working with some uh, key researchers um, and we would, of course, like to work with more in this um, interesting and developing area. And um, today I'd like to show you um, or, or provide an overview of the, the workflow considerations we're taking in order to um, provide a analysis solution that can um, increase the level of insight that can be obtained. So, factors in developing the workflow um, for um, either liquid introduction, thermal desorption, or pyrolysis GC analysis of microplastics. What's the real impact? Just a little summary. I think you've heard a lot about this um, from the excellent presentation so far. Um, then we touch on um, sample collection, treatment, and preparation options. Big consideration um, is contamination um, and interferences um, right through from that sample collection and up to the GC analysis. So we'll look at that a little bit. And then applying um, the technique GC times GC TOF MS and high resolution TOF MS. This is the, this is the, the concept where we see advantages can be brought in terms of the data that we, we obtain. And that, of course, means we need to consider the data analysis and, and workflow steps moving forward. So what's the real impact? I think at the moment, I mean, it's a lot of guessing, a lot of uh, educated guessing. Um, the prevalence is wide, of course. Um, and we know that we've got a lot of different factors to consider. So we know the sources, um, larger particles breaking down, synthetic fabrics and so on. Uh, we know the accumulation in the oceans and so on. Uh, one of the big things we're considering is thinking about the microplastics and also the associated uh, toxic chemicals that can uh, be attached to them, picked up by them, and then transported um, into the food chain, for example, but transported in general, um, and what effects that could cause. So we're keeping these things in mind a little bit when we think about the, the approach to analysis. Um, you know, can we measure the microplastics, but also those materials that are associated, um, looking ahead to uh, being able to correlate um, the chemical classifications as well as the microplastics um, and so on. And as I said, yeah, so, I mean, the alignment of the analytical results will then be important. So it's important we generate data which is representative. And this is not an easy task. I mean, you've seen in the last talks that, which were excellent, talking about um, understanding the um, photo degradation, thermal degradation, physical, and so on. Um, and it's probably very hard to actually come up with a model system. Um, I think it was mentioned a few times that you can try to um, take standards um, and stress them in different ways. Um, or you can go into the field and maybe try to do different things over different uh, periods of time and under different conditions. But um, understand, understanding that impact and then correlating to health data um, is one of the aims that our partners have. And, uh, and this is why it's important to keep these considerations in mind as we develop uh, the technique moving forward. So 
I think this has been talked about a little bit already, which is good because I think we're behind time, but uh, or we've got overtime, let's say. But um, just a little overview of the, the, the pathways that we're following at the moment with our collaborators um, to give you some awareness. Um, so aerosols, water supplies, soils, and then living beings, um, of course, are obvious sample collection routes and all from different sources. So, you know, do we need physically intact sample? I won't spend much time here because it's been discussed already, but the standard approach is, as you know, for um, with spectroscopic and optical analysis um, deliver so much, but then about characterization and quantification of the multiple features I was talking about. So not only the microplastics, but all those associated materials, and then trying to actually design a method that can give us insight and confidence into knowing, okay, if we, look, if we find markers, where are they from? Are they from the microplastics themselves? Are they from the environment? Are they from degradation? Um, are they via influence of the, of the mixture um, that the sample is taken from? And of course, the stability and the impact then of any workflow steps. So how do we treat them? And what bias does that introduce upon the analysis is these are all factors that make it an incredibly complex um, field to, to look into. So we are working with um, the Environmental Research Group at Imperial College London. Um, and this is an example of one of the workflows. Uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this, of course. So collecting um, samples on filters there you can see a multi-stage impactor and the size fra um, fractionated samples here can be collected with um, various options um, in terms of going from different particle sizes. So I think the one there, of course, that's a five stage um, um, device allowing collection um, and um, fractionating from PM10 to 0 0.01 microns. And then in the middle, you can see it actually on site. So um, this is actually an urban collection site on a busy uh, street in London. And then, of course, the non-urban but rural um, collection sites. And there we have uh, Dr. Stephanie Wright of, of the group in, uh, at Imperial College London. That's one of the rural collection sites. So in the middle there, you see what we would end up with. This is uh, what the filter looks like. And our key factors, um, you know, you know how representative are the, are the samples from the position of the device? You know, what is the impact of frequency of, on collection? You know, do we collect for 24 hours and the collection time is important and remove a filter? And then do we do it again? How often should we do it in order to generate representative data for that particular field location? What's the capacity of, of the, um, the filter of the device? And how does the device and the environment affect the retention of the volatiles and semi-volatiles, um, which are not associated with and associated with the microplastics? What's the impact on the airflow and the weather um, and these things on the sampling rate? And how can we add sample device control? What levels of control can we implement in order to mitigate the changes in the weather and so on? And then, of course, environmental bias um, in the location. Um, you know, what is representative and what changes, you know, what would cause spikes in our data, uh, such as nearby building sites, um, machinery, and so on. And then what about samples in waters and sediments, you know, dirty samples and so on, where we've got um, various organic matter as well as inorganic matter, freely dissolved species, and then microplastics and nanoplastics and so on. So in order to have a workflow for this, this is about, um, and I think, I think it was nicely described in the last uh, talk, employing uh, these uh, this uh, piece of workflow and so on. So um, this is something we're looking at with um, the Norwegian Institute for Water Research, and they have developed and are still developing various workflows and of course, we keep in mind with the analysis procedure, um, the validation of these workflows is important and that's where we come in um, and we want to particularly 
be able to test each and every step. So I think um, some of these um, um, steps have just been previously talked about. So I won't spend too much time, but of course, um, one thing I wanted to mention here is that these different workflows and the sample variety um, and looking at recoveries um, and testing um, how optimal the process is, is quite important to us. And we're very interested in um, working with you um, and your the expertise you have and uh, if you're willing to talk about your workflows, um, that would be also very interesting in terms of collaboration too. One thing I should mention here is that the looking at the impact um, actually of the workflow, um, we feel is quite an important consideration from some of the, the work that's in progress at the moment. So the sample preparation and the impact on the microplastics and other species, and then how to differentiate between those results or knowing you know, the cause of what we see compared with actually the rate of um, degradation in the environment is also an important factor um, and not so easy um, to find a solution to other than um, by following um, a significant amount of experimental work. So we go a little bit to talk about contamination and sample handling. Um, just a few images here of some of the typical things that we might do in the laboratory. Um, and the key thing is here that um, all of these um, steps in a workflow, of course, the source is to introduce error into your um, data by the sample handling and the analysis. Of course, the environment of the laboratory is very important. Um, sample storage and handling, and then the transfer from storage to a device. So you can see a liner there, um, an inlet liner, um, and also how we handle standards in order to generate the calibration curves for quantification compared with, and, uh, how we might handle the sample is also different. Um, different levels of solubility, different types of dilution. We're also pursuing solid dilution with inert solid materials um, and using grinding mills as well. Um, but what we see is all these, all these areas um, introduce um, error to our analysis and we have to just be aware of them in order to mitigate them. Um, so this is something which is very, very key. Just a little example here, um, the chromatogram on top there, um, these are total ion chromatograms from Tama Flight, mass spectrometer, Lico Pegasus BT. And just an example, um, which was, which is quite, it, it, it shows quite a lot, I think here. So the top trace is a liner, which has been preconditioned. So it's been um, conditioned in a furnace overnight and then um, analyzed and you can see it's pretty clean, pretty good. Um, the trace below is the same uh, way of treating a liner, but then just touched slightly, just slight touch interaction with human skin. And this is what we see. So contamination um, is a real key factor that we have to be aware of because when we're looking and you'll see later the complexity of the data we generate, when we're very keen to not only study the microplastic markers but also associated chemicals what we're finding is a huge amount of chemical features here also i just want to capture um, some normal system background and apologies to those of you who are not chromatographers but this is something that's very important to, to us um, on a daily basis and also in very important in terms of supporting research initiatives. Actually quite simple, but I mean, inlet and vial um, uh, septa contamination is always prevalent in GC analysis, as is the, um, is the degradation of the capillary column and the bleed you see. So here, just to show you um, actually in the plots there, the main feature picture, the ions extracted are representative ions from um, at the top is from septa and then below that from column bleed and then you can see at the bottom the total ion chromatogram and um, this is actually from a real sample just filtered out for these for these masses but of course you know, if you look at the response on the left 
the um, the, uh, the bleed and the contamination from the system is um, significantly lower than you can see from the bleed uh, from the from compared with the TIC. However, still an issue. If you look at the 3D plot from GC Times GC analysis, there in the bottom right-hand corner, um, you can see these um, almost like these, I would call them streaks. But um, this um, um, contamination, this bleed, is prevalent throughout the whole chromatogram, and that's very important. And the reason, one of the reasons why GC Times GC is very important, not only to separate analytes from analytes and from sample matrix but also to separate them away from the system contamination. And when we're looking at doing non-target screening in particular, or trying to separate and identify tricky species which are priority with others, removal via some GC separation is important. I don't have time to discuss it all today, and I don't want to go into a typical uh, manufacturer's talk, but I'd be very happy if people would like to find out more. But the key message here is it's a way of generating cleaner peaks, cleaner mass spectra, and therefore allows you to have a higher level of confidence in terms of your identification capability. So applying um, the method to validate those workflow steps, we know from all these excellent talks, um, all the different um, routes that have been taken, and the development and the validation of a certain approach is vital, especially when we want to go into assessing large sample sets. So we want to study, for example, um, urban areas, for example, in London or in Augsburg in Germany. And we want to be able to run large sample sets. We want to get robust data and we want to study the outcome and correlate that with public health data. So we have to be able to all have a strong instrumental method to validate the approach before we embark upon significant real studies in order to give us confidence in what we will be doing. So some of these things I think you've seen already. Um, so pyrolysis analysis of solid solids and of dissolved materials and liquids, both pyrolysis and thermal desorption analysis of dispersions as well. We do thermal desorption analysis to, to access and remove associated materials and contaminants. And we're looking at standards, of course, to make sure our markers are correct and we need the standards to establish calibration, calibration and quantification. And we need to assess any background materials and interferences from the different grades of standards that we have as well. Just here, I won't spend too much time, you're familiar with all these, but what we're doing and we are building up typically uh, more and more our libraries um, we need to understand all the materials that we see from the process, from the degradation, thermal degradation. Retention index data is very important. So we always use alkane standards um, and apply the analysis of alkane standards to the particular methodology, particularly because we're focusing not only on the marker analysis, but also we're carrying out non-target screening and we need to go through that identification process. So the mass spectrum information is, is simply for many species, not enough. We need retention index data as well. Um, so combination of markers, the marker ions and the retention index data, and then coupling that to the non-target screening is also is very, very important. So of course, studying this and learning about the patterns and the products of the libraries and our knowledge, actually establishing the dynamic ranges we can work to from the different workflows as well. So when we introduce a solid, or punch from the, one of the filters, um, or whether it's a liquid extract, that always has an impact on um, the real limit of detection and limit of quantification. So we need to know what is the LOD and LOQ in the sample and on the system, not just one or the other. Here's an example of a GC times GC contour plot, which is taken from um, a aerosol sample collected with the devices I, show, I, I showed you earlier. Um, so we've, we've employed um, GC times GC analysis for time of flight detection here. And in this sample, we processed the data with a signal to noise of 25 and we detected 12,000 features. So incredibly complex. And you can see, if you look in um, the uh, direction 
of the y-axis, you can see that you've got many species which in one dimension would be completely correluted. So they're all in line together. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to use GC times GC. Just to zoom in, this is from the same sample and some of the key patterns that we rely upon. Um, so you can see the um, an example of alkane, alkene and diene uh, from PE. And also we, what's very important, you know, being able to look for additives as well. Um, and so many other associated chemicals and building up a picture of this and being able to separate them with, te with the technique is very, very important. Okay, other considerations, and I think this is important as well. So we need to understand um, what is from the microplastic, and what's a microplastic marker, and what is actually from the environment that the microplastics were found or sampled from. So a two-step approach um, is, is important here. So thermal desorption um, in the first step can of course remove, let's call them three chemicals um, some of which may um, be common markers for actually markers for microplastics, but also prevalent from other sources. So it's important to carry out this step. Um, and then thermal resorption as a step, second, um, sorry, pyrolysis as a second step to actually study the uh, microplastic uh, components. So this the hope here is, it, is that we increase our level of certainty in terms of identification and quantification and get a more valid route to understanding the environmental um, loading of species plus what the microplastics bring. And it's a complex situation, of course, because you know we have to also understand what happens when materials are transported by microplastics and as microplastics break down in different ways, you know, at the, what stage do associated materials become what you would see as free um, volatiles in this method, rather than being uh, retained actually within um, the microplastic surface structure. So this is all um, going to be very, very key in terms of the workflow steps and separated out much, much further um, in order to, to gain the insight required moving forward. So a little bit here um, about data analysis and the next workflow steps that we are pursuing. So how do we evaluate the data? So just one uh, program we're using and um, also many other routes, of course, but um, we need to do comparative work on the data and we're using a tile-based approach developed by uh, Cinevep. So in this case, we were breaking that um, multi-dimensional separation space up into a series of micro tiles. And this is a Fisher-based, Fisher ratio-based approach. So comparison of calculated Fisher ratios. And then we can use that data for um, carrying out PCR. And hopefully, because the data is very complex, it's a way of automating somehow um, in order to try to identify trends and patterns that we can then focus in upon. And then we can apply, you know, where we don't understand or we can't identify certain um, spikes in the data, we can then employ uh, methodologies in high resolution, high resolution TOF MS. And the advantage there is we can use the same, by using high resolution with time of flight, we can also operate across the whole mass range the same way and employ the same GC times GC separation uh, capability, which means we've got correlating separation space data, and when needed, we can employ high resolution um, to give us additional identification power. Just an example here of the software, and um, any questions on that? Of course, we could we could talk after the meeting and, and be in contact. The next steps: What are we doing? And continuing with so as i said the workflow development optimization and testing of, and validation of these steps on the sites the devices handling preparation steps and the instrumentation is introducing so many variables we have to get on top of we need to source more standards and evaluate them this is important 
Um, and, and in terms of the age and the stability of these and studying um, any interferences. Moving into looking at rubbers and tire wear, and this is a complex area as well, particularly difficult in terms of the sheer size of, uh, of or sheer number of species um, and additives. But well, it's very important, nonetheless, to the library, as you saw in the console plot, huge amount of features, many of which we believe come from um, rubbers and tire wear. Further analytical development, as I said, um, on the non-target screening, up further optimizing separation con conditions. And then knowing when we can deploy the workflow. So run larger, um, larger scale real sample studies so we can generate data which can be correlated to health data. And of course, we're always looking to uh, collaborate. Um, most of you, of course, know far more than I do about the mechanisms of microplastic degradation and so on and so forth. Uh, but hopefully we can also offer, um, let's call it uh, workflow tools to help with your um, advancement of your research. So I'd just like to thank our collaboration partners, so Stephanie Wright and Joseph Livermore at Imperial College London, Ian Allen and Saya Samilipour from the Region Institute for Water Research, Thomas Gröger and Elena Hartner from the Helmholtz Centrum in, in Munich, and uh, my colleague Jürgen Wendt um, at our European Application and Technology Centre. And um, also thank you very much for bearing with me um, during the presentation and uh, if you have any questions in the future, very much, uh, I'd be delighted to for you to get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, you know, we're running behind the schedule quite. Um, so I'll go with one question for you. And if any initial questions, uh, people can contact you by email or they can go to your booth and discuss further with you. The uh, question what we have here is, what is the best analysis method for microplastics inside the soil? And as well as a leachate as well. Any suggestion of this? What is the best analysis method? Good question. I mean, I think it's very much dependent on, the, there are different types of extraction you can do. Um, and of course, removal of um, associated, um, well, materials associated with the microplastics compared with organics and inorganics from the soil. There, there are different approaches. And I think, you know, looking at what we have to do is study. Um, what also a key thing is the sample size you take um and the, and the and the solvent you use um and at the moment actually we are looking at different um tweaks to this kind of workflow and being able to understand a little bit more because the, the recovery is so important so i would say at the moment i can't give a clear answer on that but watch this space and hopefully we will uh, develop that further as i'm sure many of you you guys are doing as well Okay, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Uh, excellent presentation. Guys, so, you know, you can reach out to uh, Nick. You can also send a personal message, private message. We have a discussion with him.